question is, what is physiology? So basically, have you ever wondered what makes your heart rate go up when you get frightened? Have you ever thought about what makes your stomach growl when you become hungry? So the Oxford Dictionary uh, defines physiology as the science of the functions of living organisms and their parts. That's what we look to do. So when we study physiology, what we want to do is try to study one particular aspect of physiology while keeping everything else controlled. So therefore, we can see what that one thing does. I'll tell you a little bit how that is really a problem in terms of studying physiology. Basically, this is the simple thing in terms of physiology. You have some factor which causes a response. It's hot outside. You sweat. We try to understand that mechanism. Sometimes there are multiple factors that cause the same, may cause the same response. So what we end up doing is trying to control factor one and two and look to see what factor three does and do the whole, all the potential perturbations to see what happens. Okay, but this is actually really physiology in a very small concept. What happens is we have multiple factors that all interact with each other and then they end up causing a response and that response will actually end up causing a feedback going back to the initial input. So it's a little bit of a challenge to try to understand this, to try to control one when you have all these interactions. Integrative physiology. So I am classified as an integrative physiologist. I try to understand how everything works together. So it integrates many mechanisms and regulatory functions from molecules all the way up to whole organs to the whole body. So we recognize the importance of compl considering complexity and variability, and that will be important at the end, in terms of translate what we do in the lab out into the real world. So a little bit of a history of what I'm going to talk about. In 1968, there was a graduate student in the Department of Physiology named Tom Coleman. That is not his 1968 picture. That is a more recent one. Um, Tom had a master's in electrical engineering, and he was trying to understand the mechanisms that caused hypertension, high blood pressure. He was working with Dr. Arthur Guyton, who was the chairman of the department at the particular time. And they tried to take a little bit of a different tact in terms of how to try understand what's going on because the human body is very complex. So they developed a mathematical model of the human body. And that is actually shown here. And this was actually in 1972 published paper and it actually had 450 variables in it. So the important thing about this was it actually demonstrated the role of the kidney in controlling blood pressure which has been a major role for, for a lot of the research at the medical center over the last 50 years. Tom continued working over, this, over the next, since 1968. Uh, I took the project over a couple of years ago, and this is the current version. So we've gone from 450 variables up to almost, a little over 10,000 variables and parameters. This just shows all the interactions that we have. You look on the right-hand side, we actually have 14 organ systems. We have uh, cardiovascular, renal, respiratory, nervous system, metabolism. We can do sex differences. We can do drugs, legal drugs, but we can do drugs. And we can do different types of pathology, such as, again, hypertension, diabetes, obes obesity, heart failure, and look at some of the responses that take place with that. So what do we use this model for? The model is called Humod. You can actually download it if you wish at humod.org. This is actually the demonstration of the model. So we're going to bleed a person. We're not going to kill them yet, but we're going to bleed them. So basically, this is what it looks like. And if you look on the left-hand side, these are all the parts. And there are multiple menus in, within each of these. So what we're going to do is we have our control system here looking at blood pressure. Uh, we're going to do a control for 10 minutes, and now we're going to go up to hemorrhage, which is the tab all the way at the top. It's bleeding at 100 mils a minute, a milliliters a minute, and we turn it on. We'll go back to chart, and we'll go for 15 minutes. And what you see during this period of time is that there's a fall in blood pressure, there's a reflex increase in heart rate, which is what you would expect. We went for another five minutes, and you can see that it's actually blood pressure tends to fall a little bit. So let's now go look at some of the underlying things that take place. 
first tab is actually blood volume, which shows you that you're actually losing this blood, blood volume over a period of time. The second tab looks at nervous system, which is the sympathetic nerves, which actually work to constrict the blood vessels in your body to try to maintain your blood pressure. You can see as the nervous activity is going up, so hopefully we can increase our blood pressure. The third one is actually what's called norepinephrine, which is also released from your nerve endings and your, from ad your adrenal, and the whole purpose, again, is to constrict, constrict your blood vessels. So one of the consequences of constricting your blood vessels is that you limit flow to particular organs. You essentially make it less flow go there. So what you see is if you go look at what's happening with the, with the gut under splanic circulation, you can see as flow is going down. Two things you have to protect, the heart and the brain. With hemorrhage, those are the two things. We can actually go up to the top and last look at what happens with the kidney, and that's actually going down also. So this is, what we, this is what the model looks like in terms of using it from day to day. So what do we use it for? We actually use it for education. The challenge with that particular thing I showed you, it is extremely complicated. Students get lost. They don't know where to go look. So what we've done is we've actually created a, a site called Just Physiology, and we'll give you a little bit of a demonstration with that. We actually have a patient called Mrs. Pale. She gets dizzy when she stands up. I have the weird names I put in for that. So uh, we can actually, s we limit what students can see. We'll go ahead and do a simulation for 10 minutes. And this is all running on Amazon servers, so students can do it whenever they want to. And what you'll see is we give a normal blood pressure and everything looks pretty fine over this, the next couple of minutes while the simulation goes across. At 10 minutes, what we will do is we will turn it to where she's standing up. And this is a very simple thing. Again, go for 10 minutes. And what you'll end up seeing is her blood pressure falls dramatically. She gets a reflex increase in her heart rate, but you can see it's going down very low. And so therefore, she has a problem. Clinical problem, there are some options over on the right we're not going to go into today, which we could treat her to try to prevent her orthostatic hypotension. We actually use this with medical students to hopefully understand what disease states, what appropriate treatments are, and if there are problems for them to learn it in this particular case, then not with their real patients. The second thing we use it for is research. And this is, I'm going to give you a little bit of a study that was done by a colleague of mine. He was working on a device that was very similar to a pacemaker, and it actually worked like this. The pacemaker ended up working through some factor which stimulate the nerves, and you would actually end up with a decrease in blood pressure. Turns out it worked extremely well. The, this was the basic physiology design, idea behind it was that the nerves were involved. So what he did was he actually surgically removed the nerves that went to the kidney, which was very important. He removed that, and what he got was this, exactly the same fall in blood pressure. So he was sort of in a conundrum. He said, okay, this is the way I think it works. I removed that factor. It didn't work. So the next slide actually shows you that's his experimental design and everything in red was when he turned the pacemaker on and you see the blood pressure fell for this couple week period and as soon as you turn it off it comes back up to normal. So we started thinking about this and said well let's use Humod and run the simulation and see what happens. So when you run the simulation we got exactly almost the same response. This was actually when we blocked the nerves. So therefore, what ended up happening was we went through and dug through the model and did a little bit of exploration to figure out what was going on. And what we found out was there was a hormone that nobody had really thought about. We knew it went up. We knew it changed. But how, what its importance was suddenly came to the forefront. And this goes back to the point is that we have very redundant systems inside our body. If we didn't, something, one thing goes wrong, we wouldn't live very long. So there are lots of these systems that interact together. So that's one of the values that we have in terms of using this particular model of human physiology to try to understand these redundancies. So the last thing is we're working on, and this is probably more exciting than probably anything I've done in my last 30-something years of being a faculty member. So we're looking at using the model for what's called in silico clinical trials. So if you think about this, there are a lot of clinical trials that are going on, whether it's for a device to treat something or whether it's for a drug to also treat something. But looking out at this 
audience, we are not alike. We all have different makeup, whether it's our genetic, whether it's our diet, whether it's our lifestyle. It really is a big challenge to try to figure out how each of us would respond to the same treatment. And in fact, if we gave all of you a very simple treatment, such as maybe a diuretic, we would have people that would respond with a big response, some people that would respond with a very small response, or not at all. So how do we go about looking at that? So what we have done is develop the ability within Humod to create virtual populations, virtual patients. <laughs> if with the sufficient computing power, we could do 50,000, we could do 100,000, we could do a, a million patients that are all different from each other. And so what happens is we want to use this in terms of helping with clinical trials to, to understand those patients that would respond to a treatment, whether it's a device or a drug, and more importantly, those people that do not respond. Because if you have somebody that doesn't respond, it's not of value to treat them with that particular device. And especially if you're trying to do the clinical trial, it's better if you don't have them if know who those people are, so therefore you don't include them in your trial. So we've tested this a little bit. We've actually had some work with, we've got interest from the Food and Drug Administration and a, particularly a, a medical device company. So we did a very simple clinical trial. We generated 2,000 patients with, with hypertension. And we used this treatment that is actually in development. We simulated a treatment, which is essentially a, something that removes the nerves from your kidney. And what you see here is the percentage of patients is on the y-axis and the pressure drop. So you can see anything to the right of the vertical line is good. Their blood pressure dropped. These were patients that no medication would drop their blood pressure. You got big drops in blood pressure. The problem is what's over on the left of the line, that number. So you actually have patients, and this is actually happens in the real clinical trials, whose blood pressure goes up. So here's a device that you don't know who's going to respond, and in some patients, you actually get an adverse effect. So this is where we're going now in terms of using our computer simulation to help with like in silico clinical trials. So what I've hopefully presented to you, what is the most complete computer simulation of human physiology, a little bit about what we use it for, the clinical trials at the end. Uh, I'm very lucky for, to be following up on the vision of Dr. Coleman and Dr. Guyton that started 50 years ago looking at doing this. And I also have some very good colleagues, Dr. John Hall, Dr. Tom Lohmeyer, Dr. Drew Pruitt, and Dr. John Klemmer that help with this project. Thank you for your attention.